Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Labyrinth, a podcast produced by Virtual Executive Director. My name is Becky Brett, and I'm your host. I'm an intuitive executive coach for artists, content creators, and entrepreneurs. This week on the podcast, I get to walk the labyrinth with author Kim Chesney and talk about her book, Radical Intuition. Kim is a globally recognized innovation leader and founder of Intuition Lab. Her work has been featured or supported by organizations like South by Southwest Interactive, Carnegie Mellon University, Comcast, and Hewlett Packard. While working in the technology sector, Kim recognized the tremendous role that intuition plays in business and cultural progress, and she set out to learn everything that she could. So this book, Radical Intuition, is the result of nearly two decades worth of research and practice that can help people tap into their inner wisdom in extraordinary ways. Please join me in welcoming Kim Chesney into the labyrinth. Hello. Hi. So here we go. Kim Chesney, tell us about radical intuition. What yeah. is radical intuition? <laughs> radical intuition. Well, it's really a reimagining of intuition. So, you know, we, t- we, we struggled with, we were trying to figure out a, the perfect title for this book when I was working with New World Library. And, and we had all these different ideas and we came to this place of uh, settling on this word of radical because we loved that it really embodied a sort of paradigm shift when understanding intuition. It's mm-hmm. not the same old intuition that you've probably uh, been taught your whole life. And so it has this really different, uh, little no nonsense approach to intuition is really very, a very powerful spiritual aspect, of course, to our lives, but also this real practical transformational element that we can use every day in our lives, in the way that we're working with each other, the way we're living and changing the world and coming together as a people and all of these really profound and powerful things that are happening right now in our culture. Excellent. Yeah. I, I, um, what I loved about this book is how practical it is because when we think of intuition, it's such an intangible, it seems, but you make it very tangible. I, that's my goal. That's my mission. My mission in life, because you know, I've always sort of lived with like one foot on, on in both sides of this world. This, you know, this sort of esoteric world, and also I've worked in technology for twenty years. I, you know, I've I've, I've been out there working with some of the, the biggest tech companies and in the world. And then I started hearing them talk about intuition. So I realized that intuition is so much more. And I think over you know in the past decades, we've really been. Uh, opening up to intuition is something that everyone has and that everyone can develop, right? You know, that, that, that was sort of a new idea 10, 20 years ago. And when, when we started hearing things like, oh, you, you don't have to be born with superpowers and reading crystal balls to be able to touch into your intuition and, and do these really mm-hmm. profound, amazing things. And so knowing that it is, it is something that we can develop and now really going out into the world and saying, how does that apply to life, our relationships, uh, the way that we build our businesses, the way we innovate, the way Way we create our culture and the way we relate to each other. And it really has these amazing wide reaches that, that, you know, we really hadn't thought about until very recently. Well, so what is intuition not? <laughs> so, yeah, it's funny. I started off my book with this list of like things intuition is and things is- intuition is not. And I did this because there's so much confusion about intuition. A lot mm-hmm. of people have different ideas. Like I would ask people or people would ask me, like, what are you writing a book on? And I say intuition. And then I had to go into this back and forth on what do you think intuition is? And everybody had different ideas. And so I realized we really need a comprehensive understanding and a real understanding that's not like, oh, talking to spirits or, or stuff like that, you know, which, yeah, you can do that with your intuition if that's, you know, what, the, the way that you're inclined, but it doesn't have to be this sort of woo thing. It's something that's just built into our design. You know, we have two parts of our brains. We have a right side and a left side, and we've only been trained to develop one of those most mm-hmm of us through, throughout our life. So this is a time right now where we're rebalancing and we're bringing that intuitive side, that creative side, that imaginative side, that side of, that touches into the core of genius. This is the place of the future. This is what is going to define our humanity in the decades ahead. You know, when we're working in, with machines and computers and robots and stuff that's way smarter than us, we're never going to get that smart. It's just not possible. But our genius and our power is still there waiting to be unlocked. Ooh, I love it. Love it. Okay. Well, let us 
metaphorically step into the labyrinth. And as uh, as my listeners know, we will follow the mantra of the labyrinth to talk about radical intuition. And that mantra is release, receive, return. So Kim, what do people need to release in order to access their intuition? Yeah, I think the, the, the most important singular answer to that question is we have to release our over-dependence on our thinking mind. You know, mm. you've, we've heard people talking about this with mindfulness. We've heard people talking about like Eckhart Tolle and his power of now talking about the important of uh, getting into this place of presence and no mind where we overcome this sort of wheel of toxic thinking that we're involved in every day where we're constantly taking our phones, constantly listening to what the world's telling us, constantly defining ourselves by all this noise that's outside of us. So the first thing to do, you know, when, when we want to step into that intuitive place of being and really open up to that wisdom within us is release our attachment to that outside world, release all of um, the, the clingings of the mind that has to constantly be redirected and reinforced in these play- ways that totally diffuse our access to our inner self. So really stepping back from the world and making that shift from the outside world to the inside world, starting to honor what's within you, the truth within you over the conditioning and the noise and the opinions of all of the things that are happening around you. That's the first step. So how do we do that? Can you give <laughs> us any, like one or two tips on how to do that? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think this is one of the, um, you know, the silver linings we're going through a a really a a tough time right now in as human beings and all of us with the challenges around the world that we've all felt with this pandemic and in the political climate here in the United States. Um, But I think one of the the silver linings to the situation, at least in terms of the pandemic and, and these stay at home orders or this, these, this having our wings clipped. So we can't, run around and do all these wonderful things that we do in our life. The silver lining is it's giving us a little bit of space to take advantage of some time to reconnect with ourselves. So, um, you know, I'd say at this time, you know, know, really embrace the white space, embrace any kind of uh, time you have with yourself, any opportunities to be alone and to spend more time in that sacred place. Because when we're alone in that stillness, in that quiet, that's where our intuition speaks. And that's where that connection, that higher connection is fostered. And artists realize that, you know, anybody who's creative knows that you have to go into your creative place. You know, even if you're writing or painting or doing music, whatever creative thing you're doing in the world, that sacred space of aloneness and connection, that's where the magic happens. So opening space in your life for that, well, even if you put block off some time on your calendar every day, if you're still busy, because I know we still are working from home, we're still doing all this stuff. We still have families that are around driving us crazy all the time. We love them, but you know, that's how it is. So yeah. even if you have to put a little space on your calendar to go for a walk by yourself or, or hide in, in a spare bedroom and meditate a little bit or something just to, to open up that space so that your inner wisdom and your inner guidance can start to speak to you in a way that you can actually hear. Yeah. I think that the pandemic has really given us that gift of pause in many ways. Yeah. And so it's up to us to take advantage of it. And, um, so yeah, you could, we can all use that to, to connect with our intuition. Um, one of the cool things in the book is a quiz on, uh, to, de- to determine sort of where, uh, or the sort of, uh, what is it? Your intuitive pathways. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, let's talk about that a little bit and, and how each in- intuitive type intuitive type? Is that what I would say? Mm-hmm, what we would mm-hmm. call it? Um, how they, how each type can kind of release that over-dependence on the external world and um, talk a little bit about what each type is. Yeah, great. Yes. And then, so, and then I want to know which one you are and I can tell you which one I am. <laughs> well, you tell me first, which type are you? Okay. I am primarily visionary. Ah, and second, person. huh? Yes. A creative person. <laughs> yes, which makes sense because I am in my day job, um, the executive director of arts organizations. Well, that's right up my alley because I also worked in the, in the arts community for many years. So I'm sure <laughs> we have a lot in common. <laughs> yes. Well, so yeah, visionary was my my first place. And then second was the healer. Great. 
And then the other two are pretty far down the list for me. So I need, I'm going to work on developing those, but let's talk about how each of the, talk, talk a little bit about each of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these, they're really just pathways of intuition, right? So there's, there's one interconnection that we all have to the, to the higher truth that is in existence in the world above us and beyond us that is unchangeable and true, right? We all are connected to that through our intuition. And, and our inner guidance. So um, this, the quiz that I give in the very beginning of the book really helps people like you experience to really understand how your own intuition has already been talking to you your whole life, right? Mm-hmm. So, so one of these questions is what is intuition? And everybody has a different answer. It's, some people think it's, feel it as a feeling or a knowing or a creative inspiration or a mystical experience. So there's all these different manifestations of intuition in our life, which oftentimes creates confusion. So people don't really understand what intuition is. So the idea with radical intuition and part of this reimagining is really understanding uh, the, the pathways with which it speaks to us. So, so that was one of the things I really wanted to uh, accomplish with this book and this model of understanding intuition, which is primarily based on pretty much on the Freudian for cognitive functions and the, mm. the old elements of body, mind, heart, and spirit, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so we can look at our intuition as communicating through us, sharing with us, opening us up, through these four pathways of our being, which is our bodies, our minds, our hearts, and the eternal connection to, to the above and the beyond. So, um, you know, I assign different archetypes to each one of these so we could kind of understand what they embody. And they're the healers, obviously the body, right? Because it connects mm-hmm. with the physical body and, and how our body speaks to us intuitively. And, and the sage is someone who focuses on their inner wisdom has a naturally open pathway to making decisions and, and having those sort of senses of knowingness that comes with, uh, with your intuition. And then the visionary is or the creative people, the intuitives who just know how to get out there and, and follow the, your passion to create these new projects and things that are going to give a positive impact to life. And then ultimately the fourth type is the mystic, which is using intuition to really connect with that higher power and to all that is beyond our simple phys- uh, physical existence. So understanding these four sort of basic pathways for intuition, um, we can we can really start to recognize the different ways that our intuition has been speaking to us all along and then start to build on them. So, and it's interesting because when people take this test, you know, it's usually one of two, either people have sort of a solid sort of similarity, everyone's pretty solid in the same four buckets, or people have one or two that they're really good at. Uh, and there's no right and there's no wrong. It's just it's just your own sort of secret sauce to your own mm-hmm. intuition, right? We're all unique and we all use our intuition in unique ways. So um, ultimately, you know, over time and practice, I, I have people take this test in the beginning, this little quiz, and then come back six months, a year later after we've been working with me and we're, we're doing the work in the book and take it again and see how it's changed. And it's so interesting to see how those other pathways that may have been closed down start to open up and come back up there to the level of the ones that you're really strong at. And, and so it's really a process of with awareness that they can all start to open up a little more no matter where you're at. Yeah. And so what, so let's, let's talk about, um, are you also a visionary or are you more like sort of evenly distributed? Well, I think now I, I think I'm pretty evenly distributed, but originally I would have definitely scored very high. I think visionary would have been my top visionary and the mystic would have been my top. My lowest has always been a physical intuition. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I struggle with, with the physical, physical dimension of my being. <laughs> I'm really up in the clouds a lot. I think, you know, this is, this is my dharma and my karma is to really figure this yeah. Out. So we all have our areas of challenge. Right. Um, well, and just because you feel like, I think once, because just because you get an intuitive hit, getting the intuitive hit and then acting on it are two different things. So true. So true. Yeah. So what do we need to, okay. We need to let go of our over-dependence on, on, um, on, on, I guess, defining ourselves in relation to the outside world. Yes. Um, what else do we need to let go of in order to fully, um, I guess, fully respond to yeah. our intuitive hit. Well, yeah, I think the big, a big thing that we need to let go of is fear. Mm. Um, fear, moving that shift from fear into trust of life is so yes. important and so critical uh, in the awakening process because many of the things that our intuition calls us to do, we don't do when we're talking about putting things in action. We don't do because we're afraid. 
because we doubt ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. All of those things that prevent us from acting on our intuition. We got to let all those things go. Your inner critic, your self-doubt, your, um, your fears, your anxieties, all of these emotions that stifle us from being the authentic being that we are inside. Deep down inside, we know what we're made of. We know who we are. We know all the good parts about us and all of our potential. And there's a world of naysayers out there that can tell us we're not those things, but, um, but we know, and part of our job and our duty is to become that and, and not even become as in changing, but to give that a voice to open it up and allow it to be expressed in the world openly. And that is so critical when it comes to following your intuition, because that's what your intuition wants. Your intuition wants you to live your highest potential because that makes the world better. That makes life better for you and for everyone. So your intuition is like your best friend. It's there constantly guiding you towards the best path showing you those things that you might not be able to see from where you're at. So in this sort of, you know, the level of perception we have here as, as regular human beings versus this higher awareness of intuition that has access to all information and knows everything. So the more we can learn to trust and depend on that, that solid truth, that one knowingness that will never let us down because it is truth, the better our lives will become. But in order to do that, we have to release our fears. We have to release our self-doubts and move into a place of trust in life and ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I will say you give a very practical exercise in the book. Um, for those of you who are, who may have the book and are, or are in the middle of it, it's towards the end. Um, but there is a, an actual practice for um, facing your fears with intuition. You want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's, that's, uh, it's the one that you're referring to in one of the final chapters where we're kind of yeah. going through. Yeah, I'm we're so gonna, glad. Uh, that name you... a trigger fear and then describe your unconscious reaction and mm -hmm. kind of like work through it. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because I, I personally feel that that is one of the most powerful processes of the book once you get to that point. And it is my own, it was my own path. It's the path that I walked. Uh, so I really can relate to it firsthand um, because when my awakening started as a young person, I very quickly realized how important that this, this process of overcoming our fears was not just in like this sort of cliche way, you need to overcome your fears. And be strong. Right. Oh, it's right? false evidence appearing real. Shut right. up. <laughs> you know, like, okay. Yeah. What do I do with that? <laughs> right. Right, exactly. So it's one of those things that it's so you know, we hear it so much and we're desensitized to it. But what I think people don't realize is when you actually do that, and this is what I experienced firsthand, when you release fear and when you make a commitment to trust in something bigger than yourself, right? But not blindly, you know, you when mm -hmm. you start to trust, do you trust because you're moved to trust? You trust because there's a part of you that knows it's something you can trust. So when you're mm -hmm. aligned with their intuition in this way, and this really um, really deeply um, participatory way with the universe and life, uh, your, your vibration shifts, your whole sort of way of viewing the world and experiencing the world starts to change in really, in really very real ways. Um, and, and for me, I had at that point, a lot of metaphysical experiences started to happen to me at that time when I realized that, oh my gosh, there's, there's something more to this life. There's something more to our sense of being than where we are right now. So, um, and, and then beyond that, the door, the outside world that starts to reflect your inside world. Again, something we hear mm -hmm. a lot, but then the doors start to open for you. Things start to align. The universe comes to you and all of a sudden you find yourself working with life instead of against it, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to snowballing into something that's really powerful and magical instead of second guess, guessing yourself and holding back and not letting that stuff happen. So I love that you brought that up and I really encourage everyone to, to, to really work with that and, and take it seriously. Because for me, it was the linchpin in everything I've ever done in my life. Okay. Well now, of course you have to tell us, <laughs> okay, tell us, tell, tell us about that moment when, when that happened for you. Yeah. Okay. If you, if we got a second. I'd I love can, to I hear it. Yeah. Story. We've got, I mean, we've got time, right? <laughs> yes. So I'll okay. try and boil it down into something that's, that's pretty, that's it, it, pretty straightforward, but it really was, um, you know, a, a, a process that went on for two or three years of my life, mm -hmm. but it started with a simple decision mm. and it happened. It was a very simple decision to trust my intuition. And I was 22 years old. I think at the time I was in art school and I had spent a day oil painting. So I was an artist, oil painter on, on the beach in Cape Pendle in, in Delaware. And 
I was with a friend of mine and he had gone off another place painting. I had been painting all by myself again in that place by myself, being mm -hmm. creative, connected with my two intu intuition for the whole day. And it was fall. So there was nobody in the beach. It wasn't like summertime, right? So it was this mm -hmm. beautiful empty beach. And if you've ever been to Cape Penelope, it's a, it's a state park. So it's, it's beautiful, untouched nature. So it was the end of the day and the sun was going down and I thought I, sh I wanted to go for a walk on the beach before I went home. That was going to be like my gift to myself, pack up my easel and just go for a walk on the beach. And I was there totally alone, by the way, I rode my bike there with my easel, right? So it was, oh I was alone um, and there wasn't many people around, um, but it was really glorious. But mm -hmm. I, I got to this place where the sun was going down and I was walking on the beach and I saw a figure in the distance. And so I had that human experience suddenly of fear. Because I thought, wow, I'm really enjoying this sunset. This is what I've been looking forward to. Like I want to have this experience with life and being alone. And it was just feeling really magical. And then all of a sudden this presence came in of a silhouette up on the beach ahead of me. And I thought, of course, my first thought was, well, that could be an ax murderer who could chop me up in pieces and throw me in, <laughs> in the ocean. And no one would know because there's nobody around, right? And of course, yeah. if, if that was my children on that beach, I would be like, get out of there. What are you doing? That's not safe, right? So I had this moment where I had to decide. And so I found myself, I was walking on the beach and walking on the beach and I was just realized I was going back and forth, getting into that headspace of fear. Like, oh my gosh, should I do this. And I'm like, I'm not even enjoying this walk. I'm like, why am I even doing this? Why am I, and this is a metaphor for life, right? Because this is how we live our lives. So think of all of this as a metaphor for life, right? So we get into a place of fear. We're just, we're not enjoying our life. We're just worrying all the time about this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And so mm -hmm. I'm living this metaphor for life, walking down the beach and I'm, I stopped and I said, listen, self, you're either going to decide to carry on with this walk and accept life and accept whatever comes. If he's meant to chop me up in little pieces, then I'm just going to accept that that is the decision that I'm, <laughs> that was going to be my fate. And I'm going to enjoy this walk or right. I'm going to just go home and play it safe. Right. Like, and so I had this moment uh -huh. and I touched into my intuition. I didn't do this intentionally because back then I really didn't know anything about intuition. It was very, you know, it was, it was an unconscious sort of process, but there was something within me that said, trust in life and mm -hmm. go just go enjoy the walk right and and that is what I decided to trust and I said that is, I have a feeling that I need to trust in it and do it and of course I went for this walk and I got down there and it was just some kid who was down there enjoying the beach just as much as me it was no killer right <laughs> and all of my fears were you know alleviated and I had a wonderful rest of my day but mm -hmm. so this little thing it seemed so inconsequential but it so powerfully moved me that I said I realized, and I was just filled with something after that moment. Mm. And I realized I was going to apply this to the rest of my life. And I came back from that trip and I decided not to live with fear. And every place I would do journaling and I, I looked within myself and every place where I had fear, I put trust instead. I, mm. I, I forgave people, right? I, I, I reopened relationships where I pulled myself back out of fear of being hurt. Right. I actually took some chances on myself and doing some things that I wouldn't have done. And I stopped living from this place of fear. And and I had the most powerful spiritual awakening of my life. Um, I'd say, you know, probably within a week of that of that time wow. of applying all this stuff. And 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 I think what struck me most was when I read uh, the beginning of Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, when he described what his feeling of enlightenment was and and that's exactly what I had felt. And I didn't know what it was. I was a young person. There was no internet. No, there was no, I had never read that book, but I had this feeling of complete and utter, I don't know what the word is, um, but joy, connectedness, peace um, that I had never experienced in my life. And, and this, this moment, this, this experience of being in the moment and totally 100% connected, I could have sat on that park bench for three days. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to sit. I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want, I could have, I could just, it, life was so beautiful and consuming that I could have just sat there and done nothing forever. <laughs> like, I can't explain it, but that is, that was what touching into that what, in my understanding was I raised my vibration. I lifted myself up to another level and I was able to touch into a level of consciousness and awareness and being that I wasn't able to reach when I had all these fears in my way. Right. And so when that happened, all this other stuff happened, like I started having these metaphysical experiences and, and I'm really seeing the world in a whole new way. And it was, it started this beautiful journey. Uh, but if I hadn't re released all that, if I hadn't opened myself up in this way, 
I never would have been able to even know something like that existed. It's something that people read about in books. And I, and I had the beauty of experience and, and I've only ever experienced, that's the only time in my life I ever experienced it to that intensity. I mean, I have touched wow. it, but, but, you know, and uh, the days and weeks came and it wore off and wore off and pretty soon, you know, you're back into life again. Right. And mm -hmm. you just have, that's where the meditation and things like that come in. And they're so um, wonderful because then you can re-enter that space through meditation. Yeah. And I, I love you. Actually, you say that in the book too. You say, you know, you may have that, that one moment will, will get you there, but meditation is what keeps you there and allows you re-entry. Um, so one, I guess, so once we release this, um, over dependence on the external world, defining us, um, what do we receive in its place? And like you released fear and received trust. Um, what happens when we, what do we receive in place of this external reliance? Yeah. So, you know, when you get into that place, you've released those fears and, and you find out that something else does come in and fill you up and replace mm -hmm. it, that fear. And that's life working with you. That is that union, that communion and flow of life itself and being part of that and not being in resistance, right? So you're in this place where you're intuitively aligned and you, you can feel your way through life in a whole new way that it, it feels good. And you, and you don't waste time on figuring things out and making wrong choices and having to learn the hard way. And I think that's the, the, one of the, the greatest things about becoming intuitive and living insightfully is we're going to learn one way or the other. You know, we're all on the path, whether we're really good at using our intuition or not that great, we're still learning, but we can learn the easy way or we can learn the hard way. When you follow <laughs> your intuition, that's the easy way, mm -hmm. right? We don't have to fail forward because our intuition isn't going to guide us to fail unless there's a lesson that we need to learn from that failure. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's really getting into that easy flow of life and that, and that place of living with ease and, and joy every day. Mm. Do you have a favorite? Um a favorite sort of meditation or gateway into flow? Yeah, I, I do. In my courses, I always do an intuition awakening meditation, which mm. is, you know, and anyone can do that. And I think I have a little bit of, of that in the book. I think there might be a, <clears throat> a little uh, outline that you can read and or go yes. through in your, I think there your... are a couple of meditations, actually. I'm kind of looking through, I'm looking through my notes, everybody. I've got, I look, if y'all could see my book. <laughs> my copy of this book there are at least uh 20 post-it flags sticking okay. out and uh double that double or triple the num that number of corners folded down and notes written in the margins but I do recall seeing at least two different meditations because I made a note to myself to record them yeah exactly myself. and that's what I was thinking you can record them or whatever you know everybody has a different style of meditation but mm -hmm. really and it, for me, I think with meditation and working with your intuition, what's so important is uplifting yourself, right? It's getting mm. into that higher vibration place. So I always encourage people to smile when they meditate. And that sounds like such a simple, silly thing, but I actually learned that um, through a retreat with a Buddhist monk. And he talked about the smiling. And if you see, you know, the Buddhas, they're always they have a smile on their face. And that simple act of smiling will lift you up. It somehow mm. just shifts that energy. And it's lifting you up, right? Remember, we're talking about vibrational levels in terms of energy and, and awareness. So when you lift yourself up, you're actually able to connect with those higher vibrational moments and pieces of information that our mind can't access. So that's our connection point is lifting us up, going into our intuition where we connect with higher awareness. Mm. It, it's funny because uh, I read when I, after I read that, that section about smiling, um, I think it was like the next day or something. I had a yoga class. I was in a yoga class and normally my face is pretty neutral and like, it's very relaxed. And I, I think me, like many other people have our BF, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> yeah. and, um, uh, and I, I remembered reading that and I smiled in my yoga practice and it, it was a totally different practice. Right? Yep. It makes that. it, it changes. It really yeah. does. So just and smiling, just smiling, even, and that can even, it works in life too, right? Because you're mm -hmm. right. We walk around and we don't look, look, look on our face and we don't realize <laughs> that, that, that our energy is showing, but, but it is a connection. And when you, you, you intentionally smile and put that joy on your face, it mm -hmm. fills your inside with joy. I'll never forget a time where I was, I was working in, in the arts field and I had a, a, a sort of confrontational experience during a, 
just some logistical uh, production for an event that I was running and somebody was really frustrated and was like all up in arms about something. And I was just, sm- I was smiling and she got so mad. She's like, why are you smiling? And I was like, because this doesn't have to be unpleasant. Let's figure this out. Right. Like we can still yeah. hold on to our joy. We don't have to be like angry. <laughs> right. It's so funny. You know, I, I was just saying to uh, my team the other day that, you know, we're not, we're not putting man on the moon with a notebook and a slide rule. You know, we're not curing childhood cancer. We make a festival of arts. Yes. It's okay to have fun with it. Exactly. <laughs> and I think it's okay to have fun with a lot of things. I mean, when you think about it, even, even some tragedies are just absurd. And, um, and what does it, they say? Uh, comedy is tragedy plus time. Mm, that is so true. <laughs> what if we just eliminate the time <laughs> and shorten that cycle? Um, something uh, I was, as I was flipping through the book, uh, you mentioned, are you, let's see, following your passion and um, being in sync with your, with your inner guidance. How do we know the difference between, um, between the path or a path, any path, and our path. Oh, yeah. And that is a big distinction to make, right? Uh, well, we know the path. The path is the path of following other people and following the world and following what we think we're supposed to do, right? Thinking. So mm. I say the, the word thinking is, is really key to that. So the path of the mind, right? All the, the things that life tells us this required of us or that it's socially acceptable of us, that's the path. But if we want to find our path, then we have to make a shift away from the mind. We have to move towards that place of no mind to that place of intuitive thinking and understanding where we connect with ourselves. And that's the way our inner guidance is speaking to us every day. The inner guidance is trying to show us our path, right? It's, mm-hmm. It doesn't want us to walk the path that everyone else has traveled. It wants us to walk the unique path that we are made for and to serve the world in the unique way that we are made for. So To know that path, we really need to look within us more than we need to look anywhere else. Follow those callings, right? Our passions. It's very simple. All these things are with you already. You don't have to go to some magical, uh, you know, meditative experience to discover them. You don't have to have some, you know, moment of complete insight. You just listen to the nudges, to the directions, to the passions that's already been with you your life. It's showing you the way every day, every day you have an idea, you have a calling, you have a little, oh, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should try this. All these little things, your intuition's there for you, giving you these little nudges. So, so all we really need to do is, is keep tuning into those and then listening and then acting on them, right? It's that two-part process. You got to mm-hmm. know it, but we, we have to act on it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, cause I, I think, like I said earlier in our conversation, like it's one thing to hear it or to re- receive the information and a whole nother thing to act on it. Exactly. And I think exactly. I'm probably after a few times of not acting on it and getting burned, that's when we actually will. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, famous last words. I didn't follow my intuition. <laughs> Oof, yeah. Can you remember, can you recall like a time when you didn't follow your intuition and, and it was just a disaster? Oh, yeah. You know, and one of the things I always say in the book is like first impressions never lie. And that really applies with people. You know, you, you might get a first impression on someone and it tells you something in an instant. And, and even your mind can go all the way against it, but something knows. And yeah, there was a person, I, there was one person in my life once who the first time I met this person, I was like, nope, nope, nope. Like my intuition was like, no, 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 no. And but like everything else fit, you know, like mm. he was smart. He was, uh, you know, had all of all my friends liked him. Everybody said he was like this really great guy. And he was, you know, no reason not to like him. But I was right. <laughs> I was right in the end. <laughs> a, a, a couple of years later, it all became clear. But it mm. was one of those things. And I look, I look back on that now. And I was like, yeah, my intuition knew the moment yeah. I met him even though everything else around me in the outside world was in the mind, rational world, 
was telling me something different. So, mm -hmm. and that, that plays into really importantly, the things that, you know, Oprah talks a lot about, um, you know, intuition and, and the value of intuition and protecting ourselves and how it really is a survival instinct in a lot of ways when, mm -hmm. when you're out in those places. And, you know, if you have, uh, you're with someone, if someone comes up to you and something doesn't feel right and, and just trusting that gut instead of trying to rationalize your way through it. I mean, it can save your life. So there's, there's a really powerful element in that regard too. Yeah. In, in the, the book, one of the things you, you talk about, one of the tools you have to connect with your um, intuition is insight journaling. Mm -hmm. um, where is it? Insight journal. Oh yeah. I just wrote insight. I can't read my yeah. own handwriting or right, <laughs> insight journaling tool. And I'm like, what does that say? Oh yeah. It's the <laughs> word tool, Becky. Um, so, uh, so can, can you tell, uh, tell my audience a little bit about insight journaling? Yeah. So, so, there's so many different ways to kind of get into the intuitive flow. And if you're a creative person, or even if you're not a creative person, writing is a great way to get into that and to unblock and to open up that flow a little bit. So one of the exercises we do in Intuition Lab, my online school, we do a lot of intuitive journaling, which is a lot like stream of conscious writing. So it's writing without allowing our mind to edit our thoughts and getting mm. into that practice, right, is a great way to develop your intuition, because that's a habit we have to get in. We want our mind to make us smart and reasonable and, and rational and all that stuff, but we don't want to give it the power to edit out these really valuable insights. And that's what our mind has done so much for most of our lives, because that's what we've been taught. We've mm. been taught that the, the intellectual mind is superior and this other intuitive mind is, I don't know, something else. Feelings. Really How mushy feelings. <laughs> Hysteria. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but that's, then now we're starting to realize that no, no, that there's a lot, there's something else there. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, Einstein's always been attributed to saying that, um, you know, intuition is a sacred gift and the intellect is, uh, should be its faithful servant mm -hmm. and understanding thinking in terms of that priority instead of the other way around mm -hmm. makes all the difference, you know, intuition first, I would say intuition first. It's first because it comes in first. It actually happens first. Your intuition comes in before your mind can even start to think. But intuition first in terms of sovereignty and authority and all of those other things, because it is the highest form of thinking. It is the highest form of connecting with wisdom. Just like that, we can connect with our intuition and get the truth. Whereas with our mind, we have to work so hard to figure it out. And it's often so flawed. So when we get our intuition right, and then we allow our mind to serve that, and to uh, discern how to apply that to our life, then we, that's the formula for genius. That's the formula mm -hmm. for greatness. And the greatest people in the world have figured that out. I, it kind of reminds me of uh, Morning Pages from The Artist's Way, Julia oh, right. Cameron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And so, so some of the, um, here, I'm going to gift, uh, gift y'all with a little, some of the uh, insight journaling prompts, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. So um, some prompts to connect with your intuition are uh, to answer these sort of questions. Um, what are my three best qualities or gifts? What are my three biggest life challenges? What was I born to do in this life? What must I learn in order to evolve? Mm -hmm. What is holding me back? How can I break through my blocks? How can I fulfill my mission in the world? And I'd say, um, if we're hearkening back, I would say at least give yourself three pages mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, and you want to go with the first thing that comes to your mind. And it might yes. be hard at first, right? In the very beginning, because you're not, you, you need to get the flow going. So you might have to mm -hmm. sputter through the first one a little bit. But then once you get it going, you just <laughs> yeah. write down the first thing that comes and don't let your pen stop and don't edit out any crazy thoughts. You can go back and look at it later and do all that stuff. Yes, exactly. Um, <clears throat> what do we do? Uh, I, I really, I will, I really appreciated the section, the section on, um, being out of sync mm. with our intuition. Mm. And I think this, this probably, uh, we've probably progressed through the labyrinth. So we, we, as we go in, we release, when we get to the middle of the labyrinth, we receive, and so we've received trust and we've received, um, the, a way to connect to our intuition and to listen to ourselves. Um, and now as we return, 
Um, it's not always going to be great. We're not always going to be super awesome at it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there may be some intuitive dissonance. Mm-hmm. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Like, let's talk about overthinking if we can for just a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that dissonance and, and that comes hand in hand with overthinking. Um, we find ourselves in that place when, particularly when we start to return. Right. So when we wake up and we realize that, okay, like maybe there's, we haven't been on the right path or something hasn't been right here. And I, I'm not living my best life and I want to fix that. And I want to step back into my power and my truth and, and all of this stuff. You know, we might find ourselves in this place of, of intuitive dissonance, right? Like mm-hmm. our life just doesn't feel like our own. It just doesn't fit. Um, but that's actually a good thing because it's information for us that we can mm. use to redirect, to pivot our lives back into that place. So I always talk about like, don't be discouraged if you feel like you're not in this perfect place in your life where you're living your truth, because it's okay. You know, your intuition is there wherever you are to, you know, to guide you back, to guide you up. You know, you're just taking a different route, you know? So it's okay. It's okay if we're in that place, but we want to get out of it. And to get out of it, we can simply follow our intuition. It's probably been in there telling you little things all along that you've just been not listening to, right? Like that's how we get there to begin with from not following our intuition. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just time to, to, to re- return to ourselves and, and, and listen to that voice within us and turn off all of that thinking that got us into that situation to begin with, which was likely based on fear, likely mm-hmm. based on listening to other people's conditioning. So if you, if you want to journal on something and you get into that, like, why, how did I end up in this situation? Well, those are the answers that are, are likely to come up because that's how we create this, this culture of business by not listening to our intuition. What do we do when we start second guessing ourselves? Um, well, I think, you know, there's, I, <laughs> there's a lot of practices you can do to, to overcome that inner critic and that inner doubt. And one of the well, great tool that I talk about too, in the book is using malas and affirmations. Mm-hmm. Uh, the affirmation process is so important because as we're healing, as we are returning to ourselves, we need to keep giving ourselves those pats on the back and reminders to stay strong. And, and a lot of that can be done through, through malas and the, the mala beads, which. Yeah, oh, tell me about right? those. Yeah. So there, there are 108 beads there. You see people wearing those necklaces, bracelets, all these different things, but they're actually tools. Uh, they're tools that you can use in meditation. They're tools that you can use any time of day when you need support and you create an affirmation or a mantra. And it's kind of like the rosary. You know, you hear people do the rosary, only you, you say that mantra or affirmation over and over again. So it's kind of like a way of, of programming our minds, mm. stilling our minds, quieting our minds and moving into the space where we actually embody this mantra. Like if you, if you're having trouble with confidence, like if you're nervous and you, or you have stage fright or something, you know, you can do the mantra. I'm confident. I'm strong. I'm all of these things that you want to embody. And then this, how actually how it's, it's amazing how the law of attraction works. You know, you think about these things and you put your intention on these things and then you start to embody these things. Mm. And it is like a workout that you can do this every day and it can support your journey as you come back to yourself. Uh, I think given what we've seen recently in the United States, um, for everyone listening, we're recording this on Friday, January 8th. Mm-hmm. It's been a it's been week. A week. <laughs> um, and one of the, one of the uh, intuitive dissonance, um, I guess, uh, categories is over empathizing. I think anyone who, of us who is an empath has had a very hard week. Yes. How do we pull ourselves out of that? Yeah. And I, and I mean, talking about sensitivity, one of the, you know, one of the qualities of being intuitive is having the ability to um, have compassion and relate to other people and, and, and understand uh, other people's energies. But that can also be a problem when there's negative energy <laughs> and uh, dissonant energy. And it mm-hmm. really sense like I could feel it. I could feel it in the air. You know, yeah. it was you, even if even if you turn off the TV and turn off the social media, there's just an energy of you can sense the communal um, sort of collective anxiety that we're all experiencing because that's, that's all energy. It's all out there. So it really is important when, when you're working 
from an intuitive place and living from an intuitive place to to do that self care and to do those mm. things that um, allow you to 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 keep your vibration up even when there's a, so much dissonance around us and uh, just loving yourself and doing those things you like even if it's taking a hot bath or treating yourself to like a, a nice walk in a beautiful place and to to really keep yourself as much as you can into the the calm clear energy of life. Uh, in, instead of the noise that, that mm. the mind is creating and the world around us is creating. What does self-care look like for you? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I think is really important I, that I do personally every day is um, something called a sadhana. If you're, if you're a yoga teacher, you're probably familiar with that term, or if you've read uh, anything about Eastern religions, and this is really just a daily spiritual practice. It's another mm -hmm. word for a daily spiritual practice. And and I recommend in all my teaches, teachings that everyone create their own sadhana, their own mm -hmm. sort of practice that resonates with them. And in the, in the book, we talk about the different types of intuition and the different types of exercise you can do for each one of those types of natural pathways when, during your sadhana. So, um, you, you know, we, we want to do something to balance our body, our mind and our heart and our spirit every day sort of a tune up every day to keep ourselves in high vibration living, to be uplifted so that we can keep living our life from that higher place where all that icky energy, just, we don't feel it. It doesn't touch us because we're on a different level. Mm -hmm. So to do that, it's like anything else, you know, you have to keep yourself, you have to feed that, you have to feed your spirit, you have to feed your heart, you have to feed your mind in really uplifting ways. So creating for me, I, like I, I don't start working until no earlier than 11 any morning because I spend the first three hours of my day in sadhana. Um, mm. And that's whether, you know, it can look like many different things depending on the day. Some days it's just sitting with my coffee and appreciating the snow falling outside in the <laughs> woods and, you know, and, and really just being still, you know, other days it's mixing yoga or um, doing journaling or writing or, or something creative. So, so it's, it can be a, a fluid thing. You know, it doesn't have to be militant or dogmatic. It, it can be something that just works for you every day. But I spend that time with myself every morning. And when I don't, like yesterday, I didn't get to do that because like it was the day after the insanity and or the day of the insanity. I don't even remember which day it was. It was such a blur. <laughs> no, but I haven't, no. right? I haven't had that for the last two days because everything was so crazy. And I was watching the news and I, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? You get so sucked into all that instead. Mm -hmm. And I could just, I could feel, I could just feel my vibration. I feel the energy just pulling me down. And so, you know, and it's okay. I gave myself permission to do that because it was something that, you know, I needed to participate in life. I'm still here. I'm alive on this planet. So I, I, I needed to do that. But now today I said, okay, it's time to get back into my ritual. It's time to, to do my self-care and to keep that, set those boundaries so that it doesn't take me to a, a, a low place where I actually start being really anxious or depressed because like, you know, we can, we can easily do that if, if mm -hmm. we don't feed ourselves in really healthy ways right now. Yeah. So as you, I mean, even with the most highly developed intuitives among us, mm -hmm. um, life is still there and, um, you know, things happen and we get distracted or sucked mm -hmm. into things and yeah, like let's not, not judge ourselves for it. Just exactly. it is what it is. And get back to a healthy practice yeah. as soon as you can. We're still alive and living. And, and as long as we're, you know, in this, in life, and, you know, unless we've moved out to the woods and, and even if you do that, cause like I did that you know, <laughs> out to the woods and there's nothing around life will still find you with challenges. You will be <laughs> yeah. amazed. Life will find you with challenges because, you know, it's still part of this process. If we're still forging our souls and our spirits and growing in strength and, and, um, you know, we're alive for a reason because we're, we're building that fortitude and, and that connection with life. And it, it does sometimes take a little friction to do that. Yes. Yes. We, I think we rarely learn from our wins. We learn more from our mistakes and from mm -hmm. hardship. And it'd be nice exactly. if the lessons could come without pain, but they seem to stick <laughs> more when, uh, when it hurts. <laughs> Exactly. It's true. And that's like that saying goes, if you don't le learn from your intuition, you're going to learn from your circumstances. And, and the second mm. one hurts a lot more than the first. <laughs> yes. Well, as we wrap this up, what, um, what do you wish people knew about their own intuition? Yeah, the, for me, it's so important. And, and this is what I hope the sense that people take away from this book is knowing that first of all, everybody has intuition and everybody can develop intuition 
but mostly that it's, it is your power. It is something that is there to support you. It's mm. not scary. It's not something to be afraid of when you, when you understand it and use it the right way. It is the most important thing in your life. It's the only thing that you can take with you when you leave. You're in, you never lose your intuition. I would say intuition is the universal language. It applies to life. You can have intuition with your pets. You hear what I mean? It's, it's the commonality of life. It's the way we connect um, on all levels. And so it's, it is the most important thing that we can do for ourselves is to, to honor that and, and to learn to accept it in our life. And that I hope that everybody will understand that it's, it's here for us and it's here for you. And it's not something to be afraid of. All right. Well, thank you, Kim. How can people get more of you? Yeah. So you can everything on my website, kimchesney.com. That's C-H-E-S-T-N-E-Y. Um, I have a free intuition awakening guide that you can check out if you want to just start now and start exploring your intuition. And you can get my book, Radical Intuition, anywhere online, all the bookstores, Target, Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Um, and I do have uh, an ongoing class right now, which is a, an intuitive development class, Illuminate. So if you're interested in checking out some live intuition work with me, uh, you can go to intuition-lab.com. Great. All right. Well, thank you so, so Thanks much, Kim. Me, it was Becky. a pleasure. <laughs> Such a pleasure. I, I'm, I'm intuiting that... Um, we will remain connected in some yes. way. I, I think so. We have so much in common. <laughs> thank you so much for listening. And thank you again, Kim. It was such a treat getting to talk with you about your book. If you liked this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, leave a review and share it with a friend. If you don't already follow me on Instagram at beckybrett.live for daily inspiration, information and support. And if you're looking for a coach, the link to my application is in the show notes. I can't wait to hear from you. Enjoy the journey, everyone. And remember, you can lose yourself in a maze, but you can find yourself in a labyrinth.